Kiki. Uh, my husband Dale and I have been together for 19 years. We have four biological children. In October of 2017, uh, we were sitting in our living room and we had been discussing the different avenues of, of expanding our family. We both were like, what about foster care? Like helping our community, serving our community, loving our community, like that would be the perfect way to expand our family. The very next day at church, the Washington County Department of Social Services was there. Dale and I looked at each other after um, the representative walked off the stage and we were just like, wow, this is it. All of our girls were on board. Um, they were happily excited, just as excited as we were. At that point in time, we really um, knew that that's what God had for us. And then everything aligned so perfectly after that, that it was just confirmation after confirmation. We were licensed in April of 2018. We got our first placement in June of 2018. Um, a six month old boy came to us. 75 days later, we received another call for a, another little boy. Dale and I prayed about it and we really felt that um, accepting this placement was the right thing to do. He has been by far been our most difficult child of all of us. He was, came to us very sick. You know, moms always want to fix everything. And with all my other children and my experience, you know, even my first foster son, I could always calm them. I could always, you know, be the one that they knew, you know, was comforting. And for him, I couldn't. There was many a times where I wanted to call and give up and call DSS and say that I didn't think this was for us because it was so difficult that it was, maybe that was God telling me that it was not he was a good fit for our family. For each of us in our lives, are people a problem? And is caring a chore? And are their needs a nuisance? Even if you don't see other people that way, you and I struggle because we think people see us that way. We think that when people look at us, caring for us is a chore. And our needs feel like a nuisance. And so we start to think that people think we're a problem. I know for um, myself personally, this has been a, a challenge. And there was one real distinct moment in my life when I really felt like I, I became acutely aware that I, maybe I thought people were a problem. So, um, a few years ago, and I'd start getting emails from our local, um, some of the local um, agencies that deal with foster care. And I got one email saying, basically, would our church be willing to kind of promote the need for foster families and, and for us to get involved and maybe being a, a, a voice to encourage people to get involved? And uh, I would love to tell you that that's why we're doing this this weekend, but it's not. Uh, I got the email and I just hit delete. And then I got another one, and they, I don't know if they were just being persistent. I can't really remember. Maybe it was a different organization. And so I got a second one and I hit delete. Some of you are seeing a pattern here. And then I got a third one and I went gulp and I just hit delete. And I will tell you why. Because for me, I've always tried to live this way. I'm going to live it before I lead it. And so I don't want to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do. And I just read it and I was like, uh-uh. Like, ain't nobody got time for that. Um, and, and I really just, I, I mean, for me, it was the furthest thing from my mind. I just, there was no way. I mean, I don't have time. I got things to do. We're busy. We got other focuses. And so I just hit the leap and kind of just moved on with life. Didn't really think much of it. And, and I think you can relate. There are times when you've been really busy. And here's the thing, right? We live in America where we're full of entrepreneurs and we get things done. We work hard. And as a result, busyness equals importance. If I'm busy, then I'm important. And if I'm important, then I don't have time to deal with little things like people's problems. And I can justify feeling like your needs are a nuisance because I got important things to do. I, I, I'm busy, I'm active, and, and so we can kind of justify that. And, and so we all struggle with this allowing busyness to make people invisible in our lives. For some of us, your own family has become invisible. Maybe you become so attached 
to what's really important going on on your phone that you don't even notice your own family. Maybe it's your spouse or your kids or your, your friends and, and you're attached here and because important things are happening and so you're just disconnected because you got, you're important because you're busy and so you don't notice people and we don't notice needs and people become a problem and their needs a, a, a nuisance. And, and you and I, it's not just that we see others that way, it's we think others see us that way. We're a problem. We're in the way, and so I do, I want to address a real clear challenge in our own community where we have unstable homes, you got broken families, and this is not us pointing fingers at anyone. All right, listen to me carefully. There are enough kids in our own community that have, they, they did not grow up in or their family situation became a crisis, and so they, they've been removed from their home. And now they're in a system where they desperately need families to care for them. They need, they need a stable family. And, and we've got more and more kids entering into a system where there are not enough individuals to provide care and love and support, and they become invisible. And here's something that you might not know. The kids that, are, that grow up in a foster system, I want to be so careful because I'm a little nervous that there are individuals that grew up in the foster system. Maybe they're older and they're gonna, you're going to be watching this, going to be participating in our services. So I almost wish that I could just have you plug your ears for a moment because there's things about your lives that the rest of us didn't realize. And here, here's the thing. Young people that have grown up in the foster system that then they age out. What I mean by that very specifically is they get to the point where they are no longer part of the system. They get to an adult age and now they're adults and they no longer are part of that system where they're getting the support they need and so they call it aging out and those individuals that age out become the most vulnerable individuals in society and often what they well what they need is for someone who's good and helpful to notice them but if good and helpful people don't notice then they get noticed by predators they get noticed by human traffickers they get noticed by Pushers, people who are dealing drugs and who offer them something to make them feel better. They get noticed by gangs. And so there becomes a direct feeder system between those that are the most vulnerable in our society, a feeder system to, to abusing drugs, being used by people in human trafficking who, who want to take advantage of others, and they get pulled into gangs, and often it becomes a feeder system directly to prison. And it's just an invisible crisis that most of us had no idea was even going on until you're sitting here and you're hearing this. You're going, wait, what? And so I want to I bring you back to an ancient time that was actually worse. So at least if you feel better, like there were times that were actually worse than even this. We're going to jump back about 2,000 years ago to a time when people were living in crisis and there was a lot of vulnerable people, people who were feeling invisible and unseen. The, the book of the gospel of Mark was written by a guy named Mark. All right, so that sounds really obvious. But Mark was a friend and follower of Jesus. He was an eyewitness to the life and teachings of Jesus. And that's important because he didn't write it immediately after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. Mark waited about 35 years to write his book. And he wrote it because of a crisis that was happening in their community. Around 64 AD, it's commonly thought that the emperor of Rome, Nero, burned the city of Rome. About two-thirds of the city was burned to the ground, and, and, and it, was, it has been believed that it was, the fire was started by Nero himself, who it thought was singing and playing a musical instrument watching his city burn, like it was a sick joke. So it's two-thirds of the city burned, and then, of course, Nero, who watches it burn, he's going to quickly get blamed, right? There's going to be this big revolution. Uh-uh. What he begins to do is he begins to spread rumors that the Christians started the fire and burned it to the ground. And so now a persecution broke out of Romans against Christians, and that spread all across the Roman Empire. Well, guess what was included in the Roman Empire? This, the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And so Mark writes the gospel of Mark, his account of the life of Jesus during a time that persecution is beginning to spread among the Christians. They're being attacked, they're being mistreated, they're being killed because 
Nero was blaming the Christians. And so when Mark writes his account, he writes it really to to remind Christians and others about how Jesus noticed the marginalized. Jesus noticed the vulnerable. You might be feeling vulnerable. Jesus noticed you. You might feel like people are a problem. Trust me, Jesus didn't think people were a problem. That's why he came. And so we're going to jump into the story, Mark chapter 5, where you this moment really jumps off the pages, and it makes this powerful point. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over the boat to the other side of the lake... A large crowd gathered around him. And so you could think that Jesus was getting caught up in the crowd. Like Jesus was a politician who just, only thing he cared about was getting a big following. And so a huge crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. Now, this is interesting because there's a few things about this, right? First, that Jesus has this huge crowd, and, and this one man comes and falls at his feet, and Jesus notices this one man. But he might be the kind of guy that most people would notice, I mean, if we were all in this crowd and, and the most important person in the entire region came in and fell at his feet, most people would be like, oh my goodness, that's so-and-so. Well, Jairus is the leader of the synagogue. The synagogue is the center. It's kind of like the big church, right? But more importantly in this, in, in a region like this, The synagogue was the center of politics. It was the center of religion. It was the center of education. It was the center of social activity. And so the leader of the synagogue was was kind of like the mayor and the lead chair of, uh, like the lead professor of the college. He was the most well-known, prominent, and wealthy citizen in the entire community. And so when Jairus comes to Jesus and falls at his feet, feet, everyone kind of gasps and goes, oh my goodness, there's so-and-so. I mean, everybody wanted to know Jairus. Everyone wanted, everyone wanted to be invited to Jairus's house. Usually people fell at Jairus's feet. And now Jairus falls at Jesus' feet. And so you kind of look at this and you go, well, of course Jesus notices people like Jairus. He's the most important guy in town. And so Jesus agrees to go with Jairus to his house to heal Jairus' daughter. But along the way, crowds are pressing around Jesus. Crowds are following Jesus. People wanted to be around where Jesus was. And so they're on their way to Jairus' house, and and a woman snuck up behind Jesus and touched him. And the reason why she snuck quietly and wanted to be unnoticed is because she had a sickness. The story goes that she had been bleeding for about 12 years. She had a a chronic issue, chronic sickness. Now, that might not mean as much to you in modern times, but back then, especially in a Jewish culture, if you had a disease like this, that would make you ceremonially unclean. So you weren't allowed to go to the synagogue. I mean, you weren't allowed to gather as the church. You weren't allowed, people that were around you couldn't touch you because if they touched you, they would be ceremonially unclean for a week. They wouldn't be allowed to go to work. They wouldn't be allowed to go to church. They wouldn't be allowed to be in community. So here's a woman who is cut off from society. She, she's completely untouchable. And so she sneaks up believing that if she touches his clothing, whatever's on Jesus will get on her. And this was kind of superstitious. It was a common thing that they believed that if they touched someone who had power, if they touched their clothes, whatever was in that guy would get on him and so, or on her. So she sneaks up, she touches his clothing, and immediately she's healed. And that's where our story continues. Let's jump in. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. Jesus sensed that something supernatural just happened. While the crowd is pressing and they're on their way to a miracle, faith, something supernatural happened and he turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my clothes? 
(laughs) His friends are like, this is ridiculous, Jesus. I mean, look at, you see the people crowding against you. His disciples, you, you see how busy we are. You see how important you are. You see all the people crowding around you and, and you're asking, yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. You notice another person who fell at Jesus' feet. It's like Jairus came and fell at Jesus' feet. This woman now comes and falls at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And here, here is this moment in history where there's a lot of people that feel threatened. There's a lot of people that are cowering in fear. Politics has turned vitriolic. People are angry at each other. Christians are cowering in fear. Christians are living in hiding. And Jesus is teaching and and, and Mark is explaining how there was this time. So he's writing to an audience that needs to be reminded of how Jesus treated people. And he says that Jesus, in the midst of the crowd, noticed Jairus. And then Jesus got interrupted on his way to healing this little girl by a woman who was sick and untouchable. And the point that jumps out of this story, the point of the narrative, is that Jesus connected with people in an amazing way. And you and I, we are responsible to connect with people. And what I want to challenge you with is this, and I would encourage you to write this down and make notes, please, at each of our campuses this weekend. Would you just pull out a a smartphone or a tablet, pull out a pen and paper and write this down. If you're going to connect with people, you connect by lifting people up. Now, as I'm saying that, here's what I really want you to take notice of. Both of these people fell at Jesus' feet, but he didn't leave them there. What did Jesus do? To Jairus, he he lifted him up and he said, I'll go with you. I'll, I'll go home with you. To the woman who fell at Jesus' feet, he says, daughter, go. You're freed of your suffering. Go in peace. The point is that when we actually begin to deeply connect with people, we lift people up. And so my, my challenge to you is, how are you and I lifting people up? Who's, who's fallen around us? Who's fallen in our communities? Who's fallen in our homes? Maybe they haven't physically fallen at your feet, but there are people around you begging to be noticed, begging to be seen. They feel invisible. Their needs feel like a nuisance, and, they're, and, and they're, they feel like even, if, even asking someone to care for them feels like a chore. And our challenge is that we're responsible to connect by lifting people up. And that sounds amazing, doesn't it? I mean, isn't that what you and I m- most need? We, we need to be known We need to be noticed. We want someone to care for us. We want to deeply feel like we belong in in a community, in a family where someone looks us in the eye and says, I love you. I'm proud of you. You matter. You have value. But we don't, do we? No, that, in fact, not only do we not, but it feels impossible. Like it's a hurdle that you can never jump. Why does it feel impossible? Because hurting people hurt people. When you've been treated with hate, you respond with hate. When you've been mistreated and abused and used, you pass it on. You you use and you abuse and you take advantage of others. See, whatever fills, spills, and so tag your it. Whatever you've been touched by is what you pass on and touch others with. If you haven't been touched, then you don't touch. If you've been ignored, you ignore. If you've been rejected, then you reject. And at the core of every one of us, the reason why what spreads is hurt and hate is that what fills us us is something far deeper. Listen to me carefully. At the spiritual core of every one of us, we're separated from God because of something called sin. Sin, which is what you and I were each born with, is this You could call it a curse. You could call it a sickness. It's a sabotaging force that lives inside of every one of us and it separates us from relationship with God. And because we live separated in relationship with God, we're cut off from God's love. We're cut off from God's family. We have no hope of a forever future. And so we treat this life as though it's all there is. And connecting with each other 
as if you are going to fill my needs. And so we need each other to do things that only God can do. Some of you, you went into marriage hoping that your spouse could fill you the way only God could fill you. You, you, you're, you're pulling from your friends, hoping that they can give you the kind of love or the kind of friendship or the kind of companionship that only God can offer. But since we're separated from God because of sin, we try to connect ourselves with other people and we try to pull out of people what fills us, but it can never fill. And so sin, because it separates us from relationship with God, ends up wrecking our relationship with each other. Hurts this way. And it leads us sin, leaves our life headed toward forever ruin, where we go into the eternal life separated from God and experiencing eternal judgment. That's the bad part of the story. That's the bad news. The good news is that very much like this ancient story that Mark wrote, how Jesus was going through the crowd and a man fell at his feet. And Jesus touched him. Jesus lifted him. And then an untouchable woman came and touched Jesus and got from her the healing she needed. You and I were those untouchable people, far from God. But God came to us. God went through the crowd and he found you. And he touched you. How? When Jesus came to earth, his mission was to die for us. You you might ask, die? That's right. Because sin, the cost of sin is an eternal death sentence. And so Jesus took our collective eternal death sentence on himself. We deserve to die forever. So Jesus died in our place. We deserve to pay the penalty for sin. So Jesus paid the penalty for sin. He took our guilt. He took our shame. He took our suffering and he put it on himself. So when he died, he died once for all. So anyone who believes in Jesus by faith, is forgiven of their sin. Shame and guilt removed. The things that separated us from God are removed. So now we can be forgiven by God and loved by God. And what's awesome is Jesus not only died, but he rose from the dead. And in his resurrection, he gives us victory over sin. He gives us the promise of forever life so that we know that our life doesn't end in death. Death ends in forever life. So when you and I believe in Jesus, we are forgiven and given new life. Now listen to me carefully. When you believe in Jesus by faith, you are different. You're changed. Where everyone else around you is just lost in the crowd, feeling disconnected, maybe even feeling like the woman who was untouchable. You become someone touched by God who then in turn can touch others. Now don't take that in some weird way. I was even worried about even saying those things. I'm like, I'm going around, don't touch somebody weird. Just listen to me carefully. I'm talking in a very real deep way that you and I need a deep sense of belonging. I'm like, if you're at one of our campuses, you got to hear me, all right? Don't... We're responsible to connect with people. Listen to what Jesus does. When, he, when the woman interrupts him, he's on his way to Jairus' house. The woman interrupts him. Look at, listen to what Jesus does. So we're going to read this again. Mark chapter 5, verse 34. He said to her, check this out. I love this part. Daughter. In fact, you, this is such a, a powerful point. I want to make sure you don't miss this. So everybody say it with me. Say daughter. daughter. All right, good. On our campuses, did you guys say daughter? All right, daughter. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This woman didn't need to be reminded of what, she had, what was wrong with her. See, in ancient times, they believed that if you were sick, it was God's punishment against you. So she lived for 12 years. They said, the story says that she was sick for 12 years. And so for 12 years, she believes she's been cursed by God. She believes that she's not only separated from people, but separated from God, that not only do people not want to touch her and can't touch her, but God can't touch her. And then suddenly when she got a hold of Jesus and her life is, her, her sickness is healed and then Jesus notices her. Jesus didn't just keep walking and, and let her get healed. Jesus stopped everything, turned, noticed her, and then he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Check this out. This is so important. He, he calls her part of the family. You're a, you're a child of God. You belong in the family of God. You're one of us. 
A woman who hadn't been touched in 12 years is suddenly touched by a loving God. A woman who didn't belong is, is in an instant welcomed into the family of God. She, her faith is affirmed, her sickness healed, and she's given peace, meaning restoration in relationship with people and, re, and restoration in relationship with God. And, and so the, the critical part is this. What I want you to notice is that God restores this woman calls her a daughter simply by connecting with her. Now, let's jump, let's continue in the story. So now he goes to Jairus' house. He went in, and after he heals this woman, um, news comes to Jairus that his daughter had died. So the interruption cost Jairus his daughter's life. But Jesus says, don't worry, we're going to go to your house anyway. He went in and said to them, why all the commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kom, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was about 12 years old. An interesting little little. Uh, parenthetical statement. So when this woman got sick, this little girl was born. For as long as this girl's been alive, that woman had been untouched. She had been unnoticed. She had been invisible. And so it's just an interesting little parallel that this little girl dies. And on Jesus on his way to touching this girl is touched by an untouchable woman. And her life is radically changed. So how do you connect with people? Well, you lift others up simply by making it personal. Keep it personal. I would love for you to make a note of that, but please don't let it just be a note because I, I want this to settle into your hearts. How do you do that? Let it go from whatever you're typing, from your hand to your head to your heart so it becomes a habit. The only way you're going to truly connect is if you're not trying to connect with a crowd. We, we get people who come into LifeHouse and they look around at our, maybe whatever campus you're in and you think, oh my goodness, LifeHouse has three locations. We have five campuses. There's thousands of people that gather on the week and how am I ever going to make friends? You know how you make friends? Talk to the person sitting next to you. You know how you make friends? Slow down out in the lobby and talk with somebody. Go to next steps. Get plugged into a life group. The point is, keep it personal. Get to know one person. Learn somebody's name. Buy somebody a cup of coffee. Invite somebody over your house for dinner. If you're new with us, we want you to get plugged into a life group because the way you're going to connect is by making it personal. You know what Jesus did? He stops in the crowd and he notices Jairus and he lifts him up. He's on his way. The crowd is pressing in and a woman touches him and Jesus noticed. I fear that too many of us, when somebody touches us, we don't even notice. And then Jesus stops and he says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. You see the relationship? He says, you belong. You're part of my family. You're, my, you're a daughter of mine. You're a child of God. You're a friend. So he doesn't just notice the most significant in the community. He notices the most untouchable in the community. Jesus keeps it personal. Notice just one person. I love the way uh, Andy Stanley says this. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Just do it for one. Maybe, maybe at work you're overwhelmed by all the people that you're like, man, how do I connect with them? Just connect with one person. Maybe you're, maybe you're struggling making friends at school. You don't have to make friends with everyone. Just make one friend. Start with one person and see what God can do with that. Keep it personal. Here, here's the thing. Jesus allowed an interruption to become an introduction. Some of us, we think that those, those interruptions in the grocery store, those interu interruptions at work are the problem. They're not. Sometimes interruptions are an opportunity for you to have an introduction with somebody who needs to encounter God. They need to encounter love. They need to experience what it sounds like to be her, to, for someone to say, daughter, welcome home. Within the family of God, we believe that there's always room for one more. This isn't a closed off family. There's always room for one more. 
I want to I want to continue and jump into one more really practical moment in this story. Uh, if we're going to jump ahead to Mark chapter five, if you guys could just put it up on the screen here. Um, when when he's talking with the woman, because there's, there's another key to this. It's not just that it's personal. Listen to what Jesus does. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. When she touched him, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. He said to her, "Daughter." Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So Jesus didn't just say, daughter, welcome home. She's healed. She's transformed. Her life is changed. And then with Jairus, right, what what does Jesus do? It says this. He took her by the hand. He goes to the little girl. He takes her by the hand and said to her, Basically, little girl, I said to you, get up, right? Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old, and at this, they were completely astonished. See, connecting with people isn't just personal. You don't just call people by their name. You don't just get to know people. You actually have to get deeply and intimately involved in their lives. So lifting others up must be practical. So it's personal and practical. Practical means this. You meet somebody who's disconnected and you welcome them in. You see somebody who's fallen, and you lift them up. You see somebody who's sick, and you begin to help and offer whatever healing you can offer. You see somebody who's in financial crisis, and you begin to offer help. You see somebody stranded on the side of the road, and you pull over, and you actually help. See, we see through the crowd to hurting people who need help. We don't, we don't just, we're not so busy because we're so important that we don't have time for people. We keep it practical. We actually offer real help to people in real need, right? Jesus finds a dead girl and gives her life. Jesus meets a sick woman and gives her healing. An untouched woman, and he allows her to touch him. And for you and I, we've got to find practical ways to get involved in the lives of people who feel untouchable. They feel unnoticed. They feel invisible. I know for Laura and I, after, after I got those emails, I felt like God spoke to me in a very similar way to what I just preached to you. And so we became foster parents. I said, I'm not going to lead it until I live it. So now for a couple years, Laura and I and our family, we've been foster parents. We've had placements in our home with kids. We've had a privilege of caring for and loving And it changes your attitude and your perspective when it's personal. But my goodness, it's practical too, isn't it? Late nights and early mornings, it becomes really practical. But you know what? It's so worth it. In fact, that's Kiki wanted to share a little more of her story. So check this out. I remember one time specifically, it was 5.30 in the morning and Isaiah had been crying most of the night. I was crying, Isaiah was crying, and I was praying and I... And I said, and I said, God, I need to know now if this is what is for us because it has come to the point where I don't know if I can take anymore. I'm so tired. And I remember instantly my tears stopped and I felt like that was God saying, Kiki, I've got you. This is it. Like, this is what I have for your life. We had the opportunity to adopt Isaiah May 20th. And that very day, um, Isaiah, for the first time, laid his head on our chest and fell asleep. At that point in time, I knew that that's what God had for us. Isaiah finally felt that he belonged. When we legalized Isaiah's adoption, he was no longer an orphan. God has just healed him in so many ways and continues to heal him. You know, we're not out of the water yet. Um, We still have some medical issues that we are dealing with, but he has come so far. Um, It has been an incredibly difficult journey although it has been one of the most rewarding journeys we have ever been on for not only myself and my husband, but for my children also. They have learned so much in the world of foster care that there's a life outside our own that is different from what we live inside our home. These boys have brought a different life to me in general. Like, it's, and it hasn't been easy at all, but it's been worth it, you know? <laughs> it's been worth it. If foster care adoption has ever been a thought Um, for you and your family, or maybe this is the first time you've ever heard of it. Um, I just challenge you to to just look into it, to see what it's all about, to pray about it. I really believe that if you press in and God is your strength, you can do foster care. 
There are so many people in the church community and there are so many children in foster care. And if we just have 10 people from this church and 10 people from the church down the road that take a child, there won't be children that don't have homes. Loving the community is a whole different love. And once you've experienced God's love and can give that out to the community, it changes your life. I want to give you some really clear challenges. I think I've poured my heart out by showing you the example of Jesus. And Mark was writing that story in a time of crisis where people felt disconnected. They were feeling threatened and persecuted in a culture that was in political turmoil. There was cultural turmoil. And Mark leaned back on the example of Jesus, how Jesus connected with people and lifted them up. People who were suffering, people who were lost in the crowd, people who felt untouchable. In a very real and practical way in our community, that's where we stand today. And, and the church, is, church must be on the front lines. Listen to me carefully. Yes, there are some of you here who you can step up and you can become foster families. Can I challenge you? This isn't just a good idea. This is a God idea. This is a mandate. In fact, in the, in the letter of James, he writes this. He says, this is what true religion is, to care for the widows and the orphans in their time of need. There is nothing more spiritual and there's nothing more truly supernatural than when the church welcomes people into their family and when we open our homes and welcoming children into our lives. We open our homes. And so there's some of you here, you need to say yes and become a foster family. Some of you need to say yes to adoption. Others of you, you can't do that, but you can at least provide respite for those that are uh, foster families, meaning you're going you're gonna to go through the training and you're going to open your home up to provide short-term care for the children that are foster children in others' families. You might even offer it for free. You're just going to say, hey, I'll go through the training and I will be willing to open my home to provide free babysitting for other foster families. Man, that would be a huge need. Others of you, you can volunteer within DSS. You can get involved in the way we support um, foster families in our community. Okay, so I've laid that one online. Let me, let me give it a second part to that. There are some of you, there are just people in your life. They feel untouched and they feel unnoticed. This isn't just a good idea. This is a God idea. It's time for you to slow down and notice people in a very personal way and in a very practical way. The most vulnerable people in our society are being noticed by the wrong people and they're being victimized. It's time for us to step up and people with good intentions and with the resources to help, you and I need to notice them and be a force for good to combat the forces of evil in our community. And then finally, right now, there are some of you here who you feel disconnected. You feel untouched. You feel unloved. And the first touch you need is from God himself. And that's where I want to pause and I want to pray right now. If what you need is to receive the love of God, can I encourage you, each of you at all of our campuses, would you close your eyes for a moment? With your eyes closed, I want to give you an invitation. There's some of you, you've been lost in the crowd. You're not even sure God noticed you. But today, as I shared, you're hearing and you're realizing God knows me. God loves me. And I want to be part of the family of God. And if that's you, the only thing you can do is just simply receive God's love. And I promise you what you're going to hear is the voice of Jesus saying, daughter, son, welcome home. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you for each of us. Thank you for each of our campuses and each individual. May they not feel lost in the crowd right now, but may they receive a touch from heaven, a touch from Jesus Christ. May they know that they are loved and known and cared for and they belong in the family of God, that you want to forgive them of sin and give them new life through faith in Jesus. And Lord, we take hold of that challenge right now. That challenge that we, it's kind of like tag, you're it. You touched us and now we go and we care for and we touch others. You've loved us and welcomed us into your family. And now we go out and we welcome others into the family of God. You've lavished your goodness on us. And so we share that goodness with others. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on our online campus. We hope that you were encouraged by today's message. We hope that so much more than just hearing one of our pastors speak, we hope that it was the voice of God that you heard speaking through their message. And so if today for the very first time you responded 
to the voice of God by saying yes to following Jesus, we just wanna say congratulations. We wanna say welcome home and we would love the chance to celebrate that decision with you. So actually right now you can interact with one of our online campus hosts. You can do so in the comment section or by clicking on the prayer tab. Additionally, if you'd like to partner with us financially so that we can continue to share the message of Jesus with more and more people, you can do so by clicking on the Give tab or by visiting lifehousechurch.org and clicking Give. Our prayer for you is that this is a great week ahead of you as you continue to walk with the Lord and walk in community, and we hope to see you back here next weekend.